I'm going to talk about, um, so suppose that you have a vision, okay? So suppose that you have been thinking about this vision and you know what it's all about. What do you have to do uh, next? How do you break it down into details, into the practicality? And it's supposed to be boring because it's about practice and not about vision, but I hope that you'll think differently. So, um, in a way, I'm going to talk about some love and hate between you know, architects and planners and bureaucrats and all this stuff, but it could be a really nice love story. I'll, I'll start with, um, with a good example. How many of you have been to the Reichstag? Have you have seen it? Okay. okay, so you know what I'm talking about, and you're young, so you know this, um, the dome and when it was built. When Germany was reunified and they made Berlin the capital again, People around the world were a bit suspicious, you know, big Germany again, what's going to happen? France was a little bit suspicious and anxious. So the planners and the vision people sat down and, th and said, we want to show the world that this is a new Germany, that this is a new Berlin, it's very liberal, it's open-minded, it's cosmopolitan, it respects the individual. <coughs> It's the antithesis of the Berlin that you remember in your dark memories. So they decided to show this and manifest this in a symbol. And the symbol was this little transparent dome which was built on top of the Reichstag. And when you approach the Reichstag, this is what you see. But if we zoom in, what you actually see is people walking on the Reichstag. Now think about who these people are. Women, men, Christians, Muslims, Jews, foreigners, locals, um, you know, nice people, mad people, whatever. And what you actually see when you walk there is that individuals are walking on the Reichstag. Now, the Reichstag is the state. So you have the individual literally and metaphorically walking on the state or the individual is more important than the state. And that's the message that Berlin is sending since then to the world. If you walk in Berlin, everything is transparent, right? All the buildings manifest this vision of um, we are different, we are liberal, we are open-minded. And now to my own country and state and city, Jerusalem. I hope you can read this. I'm going to read this for you. That's a poem by Yehuda Michai, who is my beloved poet in Israel. And it, I think, also says much, something about the message the, and the vision and how to make it practical. The tourist guide pointed to a man who had returned from the market, sitting to rest for a moment, and said, do you see this man who returned from the market sitting there? Well, just to the right of him, you see an important building. The Messiah will arrive when tourist guides say, do you see this building? Right next to it sits a man who returned from the market, right? So the person, the man is more important than this ancient, very important building. So this is the, the vision. So suppose you have a vision of a city, but a city is not only a vision, and a city is not only the monuments which manifest the, 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 the vision, the city is the persons who live in the city and how they interact with the monuments. Okay, here you have um, a big hall and it will cause a certain interaction between you all because it's such a massive hall and if you go to a different classroom and it's small, it will, it will cause a different interaction. So what you have to think about is how to ha translate the vision that you have into practicality and buildings. So there are two schools of thought here. One is say, okay, if what matters is individuals, what we should do is let them speak and be spontaneous and actually refrain from planning. But the other school of thought says, no, 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 no. If what matters is individuals and also the least advantage and those who cannot cope with the market atmosphere, then we should plan, so to speak, to give them a safety belt. Um, what are the disadvantages of the two systems? If you uh, plan too much, what you're going to end up is with people who are frustrated because they have these great, great ideas and they come forward with these ideas and then they meet again regulations and regulations and bureaucrats, right? But if you don't plan enough, what you're going to end up is, whoops, 
we're missing, oh, here it is. Uh, New Jersey. New Jersey decided not to plan with regard to pollution. So they said, what we do, what we do is we, we'd calculate the amount of pollution which people can suffer, so to speak, and we'll distribute pollution rights to the firms. And that's what they did. And guess what happened? In the richer parts of New Jersey, you had more technology-oriented firms and industries which could sell their pollution rights and invest money in chimneys to filter the uh, pollution. In the poorer parts of New Jersey, you had technologies which were failing in terms of uh, technology, and they had to buy the pollution rights. And they were all to together in the same area. So what happened was that you had pockets of pollution in uh, New Jersey, and this was really bad. So if you don't plan, that's bad. If you plan, that's bad. Oh, God, what do you do? OK. Um, we're missing some slides, but that's okay. Okay, so suppose you have um, to plan, because at the end of the day, even if you want to plan or not to want to plan, the authorities will not, yet, will not let you not to plan. What you have to keep in mind are three groups of people. The people, the general people, the city authorities, the politicians, and the bureaucrats. And you have to persuade them, you have to campaign in order to do this. So, is there any other way? This is too much? No, there's no other way. So, how do we persuade people? Um, first of all, if you think about the people that you have together with yourself, you have to think about coalitions. You have to think about other people who will have similar visions to you and how you're gonna attract them and draw them into your party to support your own campaign. And then think about those who will perhaps join later. But how do we approach them? So I'm using here um, a very famous theory by a very famous uh, scientist from University of uh, California, Berkeley, George Lakoff. His idea is very simple. To put it in a nutshell, we think in metaphors. Think about the metaphor, a warm person and a cold person. Why do we call somebody who's lovable, who makes us feel good, a warm person? Because when you were babies and you were in discomfort, your mother would hug you and gave you milk and warmth. So all of a sudden, your, your brain started to associate warmth with comfort and warmth with relief. And until you got this idea that a warm person is this nice person, okay? So that's his theory is how, how we think about uh, metaphors. He goes on to, to say, to, to tell us about political metaphors. I will go very briefly. There are two camps in, in the States, he said, in the United States. There are those who think about the world, the state, as in abstract, you know, the state is an abstract thing. What is the state? So people need metaphors to make it more concrete. So they think about families, and uh, one, one group has this model of um, a very authoritative father who protects us from the risks outside, and the other group has another vision of the world where there are not risks outside, but opportunities. And what we need is a nurturing mother that will allow us to reach these opportunities and grasp them. And the reason that Obama managed to be the first black president is that he had the metaphor, yes, we can. It's a metaphor. There are opportunities outside, and if you join me, we'll be able to reach them. Okay, so back to, so if, so think, lesson one is this. If you want to persuade the people, think about how to translate your vision into metaphors that will be appealing to people. Okay, now to the authority, to, uh, to politicians. Politicians have to be re-elected, so they will buy whatever the people tell them. But it's not that, in, that uh, simple, because politicians will always tell you that your vision is expensive. So here is lesson two. Don't try to show them that the vision is not expensive. Try to show them why it will create income. Suppose your vision will bring tourists, this is more income. Your vision will, will attract more students, this is more income. Your vision will attract 
uh, more commercial activities, this is more income. The third group, bureaucrats, and I'll end with this group. We tend to dislike bureaucrats because they do what they have to do. They were nominated to care for the interest of the state or the city. And we have these ideas and we don't want to care for the interests of the city. We have an idea we think about in the abstract. Well, here is how to reduce the tension between um, the two. Think about the obstacles to reaching bureaucrats. First of all, bureaucrats were brought up and educated in universities, where usually people of visions are, you know, artists, architects. They look like John Lennon and Yoko Ono. So try to, try to bypass this. Also, think about the profession ethics. Um, vision people are devoted to beauty and aesthetics. Bureaucrats are devoted to the mayor and they are afraid of the controller. So think about this, how to show them that what you do is not, doesn't go against the law, doesn't go against regulation. Think about their mode, think, mode of thinking. You will have these big ideas. Try to relax. You are young. You have energies. You have great ideas. Try to think modestly. If you try to achieve 20 ideas together, you won't reach anything. Focus on the down-to-earth things that you can, that are manageable, and you will get fantastic things. So, no shortcuts. That's the way bureaucrats think. Um, down-to-earth thinking. And last but not least, a vision is usually framed in heroic individualistic terms. Let's make it a green city. Let's make it a socialist egalitarian city. What have you, right? Well, bureaucrats think in very prosaic things about how to work because they, they work in a group, they, they, they work in an organization. So if you want to avoid angry moments and desperate moments, think about these three things. You have to persuade the people by translating the vision into metaphors. You have to pers persuade the politicians by showing them not only how much your vision costs, but how much it brings income. And you have to persuade the bureaucrats by being very sensitive to their mode of thinking. Last but not least, love your vision, but love people even more. Thank you and good luck. <laughs>